toes stained. And that can carry too. Sorry, Trini. Next up it, is I wasn't sure if that was Pat that seconded the approval consent calendar. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Pat. And next up is new business uh, discussion about the tre uh, treasurer clerk positions. Uh, included in your packets is a, an action item sheet on the uh, the topics that the board wished to discuss today. Uh, it's just information that was collected from the uh, uh, state statutes that dictate the process and form uh, select board members or municipal governments of the process should they wish to continue with reclassifying positions one way or another, uh, including ways that the decision may be appealed by residents of the town. Um, so just thought I'd introduce the topic and and open it for discussion if you wish. So this isn't a new topic completely, right? We held three public hearings on this. Actually, it was only one. Two of them got canceled. One of them got, at least one of them got canceled. One of them. Know, we held all three, Joyce. The, um, the uh, public, the community meeting we held off three. I know you and I and Pat, I think Pat attended two. And I think you may have not attended the third. You may have been out of town. No, the third was supposed to be at the, the, the schoolhouse and I thought it was canceled due to weather. That's why we were told. I don't recall. Let me see. The second one was scheduled at the Red Schoolhouse. Right, and it was canceled due to weather because we, we had, had a snowstorm snow that day. day. That's right. Okay, so we had two of the three. <coughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, Joyce is correct. We had a, a major snowstorm that day, and that's why we canceled the third, the second of the three meetings. But we had the third uh, in early January. So, can you walk us through um, what took place at the? public hearings? Sure. Um, we had only one member of the public attend, um, not counting Joyce and Pat, both, uh, I took both of them as, or Pat, I think at that point, were, you were not, were you on the select board at that point, Pat? Yes. So at that point, unless Pat or Joyce were attending as members of the community, then only Dave Crosby from the Herald was in attendance and we held the public hearings. We advertised them online. We advertised them in the Herald. Uh, we posted notices to answer as many questions as we could about the process. And Joyce was in attendance to, so that she could share her perspective as the current clerk treasurer. Um, but we, we didn't have any, any members of the community attend. Okay. So um, it would be helpful to understand from the first day you took the position or were elected into the position, Joyce, how the job has changed um, in those years. Because my understanding is it's a fair amount more complexity uh, and demanding. Um, well, I began as an appointed town clerk because Doris Bowman retired as of December 31 of 1998. Um, the select board had put out ads in, I believe, October of 1998 advertising the position uh, as two separate positions because it is two separate offices. Um, there were multiple applicants and, and I was selected and I actually began work around January 15th of uh, 19, excuse me, 1997, October and November was when the select board held interviews and then made their selection. I actually took office and, and, and took the oath um, January 15th of 1998. Um, over the course of the last 22 years, the job has become much more complex. When I first came on board, 
um, many, a lot of the stuff was still being done manually or done with paper as opposed to being done on computer. Um, it is now more computer work than it was 22 years ago um, when I began. Um, the land records were just being photocopied into the land records. We've now moved to the point where we are uh, digitizing the records and um, there is an index that is available online. Um, the complexity of elections has um, grown over the years, um, partly due to various changes on a federal level as well as on the state level. Um, so it puts more pressure and more work in order to run elections um, and more responsibility to be sure that it's run um, correctly according to statute and, um, and that we're all complying and doing what we, sh we should be doing. Um, the treasure piece of the job um, is probably less complex than what it was when I first came on board. When I first came on board, because we were still doing parts of things manually, um, I used to run a lot of different spreadsheets, which were used to compare with the accounting office so that we could mm -hmm. see whether or not we matched. Um, we no longer do that. All, all that is run by finance now. Mm -hmm. um, but there is a lot of coordination between the two offices regarding um, managing funds, um, transferring funds, um, so that uh, it's done in a timely manner and to maximize the town's um, investments so that we're at least earning money on idle money um, whenever possible. Um, so, uh, you know, th th there are a lot of different little things that have changed um, and, and make it challenging. Um, but that's the, the nice part about the job is that um, there is variety. Um, th there is always something new every day, um, which is part of what attracted me to the job is that there was um, a lot of different things to it. Um, so one thing that has uh, definitely taken place, um, especially within the last five years, is um, the fact that for the uh, elections, we now have um, an accessibility tablet that is available for voters who want to vote that way. So it means that you, whoever takes my position needs to have some comfort level with dealing with hardware, assembling hardware and, and um, ability to, and, and comfort level with uh, loading programs into the computer. Um, so there, there's a lot more computer work. Um, and, and so you, there needs to be some comfort level with dealing with um, more than just turning on the machine and, and running your program and, and, and typing in data. Um, there, there's a little bit more to it. Um, my question to the select board though, is why are we bringing this up again? Um, I thought the consensus from the hearings that we had earlier, granted we didn't have a lot of uh, public input, um, I get the sense that um, um, how shall I say this? Um, is the motivation of bringing this question back up again an effort to encourage me to resign early? Um, as opposed to fulfilling the remaining part of my term? Um, or is it just to relook at the position um, because you're afraid that we won't find somebody? I mean, over the course of all, you know, the history of Randolph, we've had elected 
clerks and elected treasurers. And they've been in the positions generally for, for long terms. Um, I personally believe that we'll be able to find somebody again. Um, we worked into the budget this year money so that we could hire somebody um, as a full-time assistant to train with me for a couple months before I actually retire. Um, and so, you know, if the select board wants to participate in the process of interviewing whomever it is that I'm looking to hire as the assistant, um, you're more than welcome to participate in the, the process. But statute clearly states that the town clerk appoints her assistant. Um, so I welcome the input um, from other people. Um, I, I'm just kind of confused as to why we're bringing this up again. So Joy, there is no effort underway at all to try to get you to retire early or push you out or anything like that. So the hearings were held and then COVID hit. So the board never discussed the results of the hearings. And some of the conversation is because we were looking at if the decision is to try to get it out to vote to the public on whether they want to move to a, an employee versus an elected official. We were thinking we needed to be able to get that together for the November election. But it has to be, I believe, town meeting day when that's decided. You can call us special meeting, but it's going to be a vote from the floor because town the Randolph has voted to vote all public questions from the floor of the meeting. So it would not be an Australian ballot vote. It would be a vote from the floor of a meeting. And the select board could certainly call a special town meeting to do that if they so choose to do it. Um, but again, it would be a vote from the floor of the meeting as opposed to an Australian ballot vote. Right. So some of the concern is, is um, some of the concern I have is, has this position gotten to be so technical and changed so much that the skill sets needed um, have become something that you need to ensure you have those skill sets and you can't do that through an election process? Yes. You know, Mr. Popular that just likes to sit on the street corner and talk to everybody could get the vote to go into that position versus the person who you hire as an assistant and train for those two months and then hope that they get elected. You know, it's a, there's a gamble there. And yeah. the question I have is, are we comfortable taking that gamble? Or is it such an important position now in the function of town government that we need to ensure that we have the right person in there? Well, in looking back through some old town reports, um, I have never seen the position of town clerk or town treasurer ever being a, a contested race. Yeah. You know, it, never say never, right? Mm -hmm. We've had a few things that have happened that we never thought would happen. I never thought we'd be doing select board meetings this way. Or, you know, so it's, I don't know that we can necessarily make the decision based on past elections and what's happened. I think the, the question I have is, is this such a critical position to the town and are the skills so honed in now that we need to make sure we have the right candidate in that job versus opening it up to the person that can get the right number of signatures. That's just the balance I'm trying to sort out. Yeah. Um, I, be I believe I believe you can find somebody, even if they don't have exactly the same skill set that I have. I believe that you know um, they would have the ability to learn what needs to be done. Um, it really isn't that complicated dealing with the hardware. It's just re knowing what the different parts are and where they need to go. Um, 
So Joyce, if I can ask a question then, to Trini's point, which I largely concur with, what do you think are the relative merits of having an elected position versus an appointed position are? Um, do you have any feelings about that one way or the other? I believe it's important to keep the, especially the position of town clerk as an elected position. I believe that you need to have that checks and balances against um, having total control by the, the select board. Um, I mean, right now we have a, a, a good select board that seems to work well, um, that, you know, tries to be sure that they adhere to statute. But I have heard stories from other towns where um, if the select board um, believes they have authority for something and they sometimes will overstep their authority. Um, I b believe that having that independent voice is very important. On the treasurer piece, because the treasurer piece is a little bit different, um, I can see having that as an appointed position uh, only because you're looking for someone who has some sort of understanding about accounting so that that's a little bit more specialized as opposed to the, the clerk position. The clerk position, the main thing is you need to be comfortable working on the computer, you have to be comfortable using Word, using Excel, um, you know, email, um, and most people nowadays use all those programs. So they have some comfort level with it and they certainly can learn to become more proficient in them if they need to. Um, on the treasure piece, however, it, it is a little bit more technical in that um, you have to have a better understanding about some financial things. You have to have some understanding about the banking system, how it works. Um, yeah, and some understanding of um, the types of products that are being offered by banks and um, their benefits to the town. Um, so while I would prefer to see both positions remain as an elected position, I could see that the treasurer piece could become an appointed one. But I feel very strongly that the clerk position needs to remain an elected position. So Joyce, just to better understand the the duties under each, does the the clerk does all the plan record activities also? So it's not just clerk, the elections, right? Clerk does all land record recording, all vital records recording. We issue dog licenses, we issue marriage licenses, we issue certified copies of vital records. Um, uh, you know, the, the treasure piece, you, you know, on that piece, you're talking about doing the tax billing and collection. Um, and, and of course with the, the clerk, um, it is the voter registration and elections. And voter registration right now is almost a full-time job for one individual um, because of this particular election year, there is an extreme interest and there has been um, significantly higher numbers of people who are registering to vote and requesting absentees. And because of COVID, be, you know, we are doing basically absentees um, the uh, Secretary of State's office has already downloaded the file for Randolph and they will be mass mailing absentee ballots to all active voters. So anybody who is flagged as an active voter will receive a ballot in the mail whether or not they requested it. Um, and then it's up to the voter to return it to the town clerk's office. It'll be up to the voter to contact the town clerk's office if they have not received it. If they did not receive it, then they'll have to fill out an affidavit. So there's there's a lot to the process. Um, and, and like I said, over the course of probably the last five or six years, elections have become much more complicated um, 
due in part to changes in the law that allow for same day voter registration and the fact that we have an online voter um, database uh, that we have to input all the information on and um, the tracking system that they have for all the absentee ballots that we have to input all that data. Um, so it, it's, it's become more complex. Joyce, I have a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned how you feel like the, in the independence of the office is, is important and how it's a check on the select board. And, um, and, I, and I, I appreciate that. Um, but how does that actually manifest? Like, can you think of a, like a situation where like you've had that experience where you're like, oh, it's a good thing that I'm independent because I can, I can push back on this particular thing that the board's trying to do that is, is not okay. Or if you have well, it, it would be, it, would be it, an example. In the past, I, we, there was one select board which tried to not have me hire a particular person as my assistant because they didn't like her. But statute clearly says that it is my prerogative to appoint mm -hmm. the individual that I want for the office. There, are there any other situations that would be more sort of germane to the running of the town as a whole that would that would come up that you can think of? Um, well, as far as um, you know, the hours that my office is open, my office does not need to be open the same hours as the town offices are open. Um, you know, I get to choose what my hours are. Um, and, um, and I think that that's, that it, that is an important part. I mean, you know, since I've been on board, um, I'm not required to provide additional hours for people to pay their taxes, um, but that's a treasurer piece of it. Um, but I have been open additional hours because um, to me um, that benefits the public uh, because it provides them with additional time to be able to come in um, and time where, uh, when they are likely to not be working um, because um, our normal hours would be the same hours that they, they would be working. Um, as far as other, other instances um, from the clerk side. Um, In terms of like checks and balances, you know, like how, how did that- Well, I, I, you know, I, I think um, again, um, like for, posting of certain warnings, um, especially for bond warnings. Um, and th this has happened in the past where um, the town of Randolph neglected to properly post warnings um, in advance of a bond warning. Um, and although the bond vote passed when they went to do the paperwork for going to the bond bank, it was rejected because they didn't properly warn it, didn't properly publish. And, and that's something that I have in the past had to remind the manager and the, the select board, no, you've got to have five posting places for this warning. You've got to publish this three weeks in advance. Um, and, um, you know, so it, it's a way to, to remind the select board of some things that they need to do mm -hmm. um, because mm -hmm. the select board doesn't necessarily always have to look at the other end of it of what you need to do in order to comply for getting a bond um, and, and, and whatnot. Um, and the, another instance is when we had to, um, at the very last minute, change the location of the town meeting um, 
And um, again, because I'm familiar with statute and I also had consulted with the Secretary of State's office, um, yeah, we follow the process so that it would be a legal meeting. Um, the way that they were going to do it would have been an Ill illegal meeting and could have caused problems down the road. Mm -hmm. So it, it's little things like that. It's just as, as reminders that, you know, there, there are certain things in statute that you need to comply with uh, in order for it to, to be a legal meeting um, and for whatever business is transacted to um, be legitimate. But town, town clerk could do all those things and be appointed, right? Like, like it doesn't, it's not really they, related they to could. appointed or independent. They could. Um, I mean, you know, the, the, I guess the other instance that I would bring up, uh, which I didn't really want to bring up, um, was when we had one particular town manager who pretty much threatened me, um, telling me that I needed to do something a certain way. Um, and he really had no authority to tell me that. Um, and, and it was an issue that I brought to that particular select board chair and, and he dealt with it. But I also had an attorney in the office at the time that he made that threat. And that attorney still told me that, you know, if I needed to pursue this, that she would be my witness to the fact that he threatened me. For the record, uh, that was not me. <laughs> yeah, so um, <laughs> if, if you're an appointed person, you're less likely to, to stand up to something if you're in fear of you're losing your job, especially if you really need the job. Um, being independent of that gives you a little bit more um, support to to be able to say, this is what I think, this is what, you know, I, I feel, um, and, and not feel th basically threatened by it, you know, that you can speak up and, and, re and not have any consequences to you about your job. But doesn't the law protect that? Currently harassment in the workplace and whatnot. What I wanna hear is like, if the, if the person was an employee and they were doing X, Y, and Z tasks, then there's a conflict with them reporting to the select board. Like a, a true, like I'm hearing what you're saying and it's nice to be able to set your own hours and to do all that. I get all that, but I don't hear where there's like, what's the real benefit to having that person be independently elected and able to control things without reporting to the town manager or to the board? That's the, the piece I'm missing. Um, well, um, I, I, again, um, if the clerk were appointed, um, I don't know that the clerk retains the ability to appoint their own assistant. Um, and I, I think that um, that particular piece can be very important. Um, just, just being sure to be able to, to hire the right personality that will be able to work with you. Um,
Okay, are there any other questions that the board has? I have one other question. Um, oh, here. If, if we do um, have an elected town clerk and you know, it's the thing that we fear happens and someone gets in the position who, you know, really doesn't have the skills or the abilities to do that job well. Um, what's the what's the town's recourse? Is there any way to remove a town clerk before her term is up if she's no. really not doing a good job? No. So we Joyce, keep, yeah. so Larry, you, you would have to Joyce, I, I'm sorry to interrupt. Deb. I, I I had and I, the reason I interrupt is that this this came up at a VLCT meeting over a year ago about the recourse for inappropriate acts by an elected official, and I, I don't have my notes uh, about of that meeting uh, on hand. But if I remember correctly, and Joyce, if you could maybe fill in if I get it wrong, Vermont does not have a recall uh, process. And so if a position, if a person elected to a position does not perform the job, but does, doesn't, doesn't do anything illegal, but also does not perform the job, there is no recall process. So there really is no real way for the job to get done unless someone else does it. Does that sound accurate, Joyce? That's correct. Yeah. So, um, go on, Joyce. I was just going to say uh, the the only one instance that I'm aware of where somebody was elected to town clerk in the town of Randolph um, and did not complete serving their term was um, Dwight Townsend back in the 1970s, I believe. Um, uh, he was elected to town clerk and treasurer. He served a month. And he resigned because he realized he couldn't do the job. Um, and at that point, Doris Bowman was appointed and she ended up serving almost 25 years. Would, would the town be able to um, switch the position to an appointed position before the term is up? Yeah. If the, if the town were to hold a meeting, mm -hmm. whether it be a special meeting or the town meeting, and the voters at that meeting voted to change the position from elected to appointed, then the town would have 45 days to appoint the replacement. Okay. And whoever was currently in the position would serve until that appointment is made. So if we did have a really bad situation, we would at the very least have that recourse where the select board could say, this is a very bad scene, this person's causing a lot of problems, we can go to the town and say, this is what's going on and we'd like you to vote to make it an appointed position so that we can change the person in that role. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Can I just ask uh, Cliff a question? Cliff, I know you went to, to Williamstown after they had some of the activities, shall we call them there. And a big piece of their challenge was their clerk treasurer, if I remember correctly. Um, and they had the experience of them not performing their duties. Is that, you went in there after that? Yes, I was, I was the first appointed treasurer. The Clerk and the treasurer positions were um, independent of each other in Williamstown, still are. Um, and to my knowledge, um, the person who took over my role when I when I left um, is still there. Um, the the clerk's position is very um, separate from that role, and I don't know that it was a case of so much of the um, treasurer not performing as much as it was him um, being very, being kind in describing it, he was being uncooperative um, and not providing 
information to the select board when they um, requested it. Um, he had control over all of the records and the money. Um, and that was not a very good feeling for the select board um, because he not, like I said, he had control of the money and the records of the money and they weren't sure that everything was on the up and up. I, I saw no evidence when I got there um, of, of any malfeasance. Um, so that's a good thing. Um, you know, I'd like to think that I brought stability to that office in Williamstown. The, on the clerk side, um, again, there was a very independent clerk there and she, on a number of occasions, had to stand up to outside influence um, to run things what she, as, as she thought was correct. Um, and so, you know, to, to Larry's point about uh, what could happen, it's, you know, it's not so much as direct threatening like Joyce described earlier as much as it is a, um, an implied pressure um, to do something that might not otherwise be correct. And I'm thinking not in terms so much, um, you know, I heard some stories today that about um, certain things being signed off on that shouldn't have been signed off on out of, out of my office um, prior back some years and, um, and then being passed along. Um, and those, or, you know, how, how do you count absentee ballots? ballots and evaluate those as to what's a good ballot. Um, and that could be key in terms of um, a lead up to a, an election with um, select board members up for up for re-election and have an appointed clerk that can't necessarily um, stand up to the influence. So th those are instances where, do I think they're gonna happen? Boy, I really hope not, not in our, not in our town, but they could. Trini, did that answer I think, your question? Yeah, it was that uh, challenge of the working relationship and what happens, you know, the, the dynamic and how quickly it changes sometimes, I think is another, just another piece of the puzzle. I don't know that I've got the magic answer. It's just another thing for us to consider. And, and for them, it was a really big deal because they had, they actually had a charter that had to be changed. And so the townspeople had to vote to change the charter and then they had to go to Montpelier for them to approve the charter change. So it was a two year process. Yikes. Seems in our case that it would be a little bit simpler than that and it would be just, just um, a request for a town meeting or a special meeting to um, vote to change how the position is. Thank you. Any other comments from board members or questions? Any okay, so I have um, one comment or two. <clears throat> so to answer Joyce's question, <clears throat> no, this isn't about, you know, um, <clears throat> finding a fast way to have you leave your term. It's more about what we do after you do leave your term. And so in addition to that, I'm just doing a little research here on the VLCT website and um, regarding the point about uh, municipal and can you actually, could, could a, uh, can you make your own, could the appointed clerk choose her own or his own um, assistance? And according to the statute, it says that they can. So it's um, number eight in the frequency and the ants qu X questions. It says here, the laws governing appointed municipal courts or treasurers do not nullify any of the laws previously applicable to electing municipal courts and treasurers. Consequently, an appointed municipal clerk must still appoint one or more assistants. That's uh, 24 VSA 1170. So I think to answer that question, yes, the, if we were to appoint versus an elected, that person we appoint could still choose their own assistance. Thank you. Any 
Any other comments from board members? Anybody from the public? It looks like Marty's muted. I have a question. There you go. I'm trying to unmute myself. Marty. Is that a select board member wants to talk? I'll, I'll stand by. No, go ahead, Marty. Um, well, first of all, I apologize for not participating in December. I was asleep at the switch. Uh, no, I had no, no excuse. But I do notice that there wasn't much participation by the public, and it's obvious that there's no clamoring among the public to change the arrangement the way it is. If there was clamoring because of dissatisfaction, I think that would be make this question riper. But I don't think it is right because I don't think there's any concern among the public about this issue. Um, and I think it's fundamentally a separation of powers question for the reasons that have been brought up by some others. Um, <clears throat> the clerk runs the elections. Um, the clerk um, determines the veracity of signatures on petitions for getting on the ballot as a candidate and for getting questions put on the ballot uh, for decision by the town meeting. And very importantly, the, the clerk is the final arbiter of what constitutes a public record available to the public under the public record law. It's not the select board, it's not the town manager, it's the clerk. And that's a very important division. There's a very important separation of powers question because when the public wants to see records, it should have a right to, and it should have an independent person in the position of deciding what's a public record and whether it fits any of the exemptions for disclosure under the Public Records Act. Um, you know, the this, this question of complexity of the job, um, it, it's been an argument from the beginning of, uh, against democracy. And this the argument Hamilton made for not having an elected president. It's too complicated. Um, well, you can hire expertise, but you can't hire public accountability. That comes in the ballot box. And it's very important to have a clerk who's accountable to the public at the ballot box. And I find it just curious, I guess is the best word I can um, put on it, maybe ironic, that there's discussion here among five members of the board who were elected by the public and who obviously think the public was smart enough to elect good people to the select board who doesn't think they might not be smart enough to hire a good town clerk. And I just think that's beyond the pale. This is a situation where we don't, it's not broke. You don't need to fix it. If something gets broke, as Larry Sackowitz's question, line of questioning showed, you can fix it. But there's no need to, broke, to fix what's not broken now. Marty, if I may, uh, Trini, if I may. Uh, Marty, I, I think the challenge is that if we, the town government and the select board get to a point where something breaks, uh, you know, just to the points that we have discussed, there's no recall in Vermont. You can't just say sorry to the person that's there and remove them. Um, it, it, if, if, if the situation gets to a point in using your words where it's broken, it is broken and then everyone has to struggle to try to work around it because well, you can call, you can call no a special recall. meeting as we just discovered and of course there's no recall for select board members either correct and then the other the other to your point uh at town meeting every, every year there's an informational meeting where the public is invited to specifically speak about the budget and those meetings are every year at least well i can't speak for every year i can speak to the three years that i've been here and then anecdotally about what i've been told about previous meetings is that I've only seen a member of the community attend these meetings to learn about the budget that they will vote on at town meeting. And the conversation at town meeting is you've seen is very you know vocal about the budget. So it's just to the point that because the public does not attend a publicly warned meeting, I don't think that's indicative of the public not thinking there's a problem. I think it's just like you said, People may be busy. They may be asleep at the wheel. Maybe they'll talk about it later on. Well, people don't attend budget meetings, but budgets pass. And, and I've been around long enough to know that there are budget meetings, hearings that I've attended and others have attended because there were, uh, there, there was discomfort with the way the town was being run. That's not the case now. But there have been periods well, in our history you. where there's a lot of discomfort. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <clears throat> and, um, and, and in those times, people come out. I've been at select board meetings where there's 30 or 40 people there. 
and, 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 and at public hearings where there have been 30 or 40 people there discussing major issues. I, w I was the president of the RACDC board for longer than anybody should have been. And um, <laughs> I can tell you that I went, I've been in dozens of, of hearings where there was animated discussion about the merits of issues. Um, and there were good discussions, not always kind, but, but they were good and they served a purpose. And just because you don't have a discussion, it doesn't mean that, every, that, that people are, are dissatisfied. I mean, if people are dissatisfied, they'll show up. Nobody showed up for the hearings on this question because nobody's dissatisfied. Marty, I really appreciate your um, comments about why the independence of the office is important. I, I think that's really good for us to hear. Um, I think this, need, this, this topic is coming up now because you know, Joyce has been there for so long and things have gone so well. Um, we haven't had an experience of having a hire a new town clerk in, in, in a very long time. And we're thinking seriously. And, you know, I think, I think doing, you know, you know, our responsibility by thinking ahead about what might happen um, when, when Joyce leaves. And, um, and what we've found over the last few years is that hiring people to work in town government um, is, can be really tricky. Um, and Sometimes we, we get lucky and we find people who are, who are really great. And, um, and, and sometimes we find it really difficult to find those people. And so, you know, out of, if, given the fact that the town clerk needs to be a resident of the town, um, we're really looking at a pretty small um, group of people. And so there's concern that, that we might not find somebody who really is up to the job. Not that the town isn't wise enough to vote for someone who's good, but just that that person might not exist um, is, is I think really the issue. Um, oh, I, I can't buy that, Larry. It's not that complicated a job and you, and you can hire expertise. You can't hire public accountability. The no, accountability I, comes with I the hear, election. No, I, I hear what you're saying and, 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 I learn, and I really agree. I just want to give you a sense of where the conversation is coming from, that we are, you know, wanna make sure that that job is, continues to be filled with somebody who, you know, really can do a good job. Um, well, from what I'm hearing tonight, you know, I'm I'm feeling much more comfortable with the idea of keeping it as an elected position, knowing that we do have sort of a fail-safe mechanism in place that if our sort of nightmare scenario came true, that there really was nobody who really had the ability to do the job out there wanting to do it, and we end up with somebody who's you know, who's really not appropriate for the position, that, there, that at least there's something that we can do in a relatively timely manner. I'm sure this board will be up to that challenge if it occurs. Yeah, that, that's what I'm saying. And so I'm, I'm feeling comfortable that that, that, that that is, you know, sort of the best of both worlds, you know, that we can continue with the independence of the office, which I completely agree is very important, yet knowing that if something really bad happened, we would have, um, we do have recourse. It wasn't clear to me that we were gonna be able to have that. But now I know. Well, thank you for the opportunity to participate. Thank you, Marty. Any other comments from the public? Any from the board? Oh, go ahead, Joyce. Uh, I, I just want to say again, uh, you know, um, Doris Bowman was appointed after Dwight Townsend resigned. Um, she was appointed and then she was elected for 24, almost 25 years. Um, when she decided to retire, the town, the select board put out an ad in the paper laying out the, the skills and um, background that they were looking for, for the uh, positions. Um, they held interviews for multiple candidates and they, you know, I, I fortunately was selected. I believe we can do that again. You know, we, we've worked into the budget already money to hire somebody as a full-time assistant for two months to to train with me before I actually retire. Um, 
and and that individual would then um, need to run for uh, for the office in March, um, and and it would be running for two separate positions because it is two separate positions. Um, in here in Randolph, the two positions um, to me have been very much entwined, um, so that. I find it very difficult to be able to look at the job and say, well, this is clerk, this is treasurer, um, and then say, well, for the treasurer piece, it would should have a salary of so much, and then clerk should have a salary of so much. Um, I, I have a difficult time trying to, to envision that. Um, and the way that it is budgeted now, it's budgeted as if it is one position, um, even though technically it is two separate positions. Um, so when we look at appointing somebody, it may potentially be two separate people. I would prefer not to have two separate people, um, uh, preferably one individual um, would be to me, in my mind, the best way to go. But I think that um, given that nowadays the background that most people have with electronics and with computer programs, there'll be somebody who will be able to learn the job and learn the other pieces that um, require a little bit more technical skill. Um, it, it, like I said, it's, it's, it's not difficult. It's just a matter of knowing what you need to do. Um, and I think that, you know, anybody can learn it. They just need to be shown how to do it and 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 go from there. Um, so uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. Thanks, Joyce. <clears throat> so I got a question. So, <clears throat> okay, Joyce. Um, what would happen if it was actually two positions and we had a treasurer and we had a town clerk and those duties were split? Would we need an assistant or would there be um, enough work for both, say, positions to be fulfilled by two individuals? The town clerk piece in and of itself is a full-time job. And like I said, right now, the election piece of it is a full-time job for one individual. Um, the treasurer piece would not necessarily be a full-time job by itself. So that's why I say that it would be preferable to find one individual as opposed to two. So technically it is two separate positions. Um, you know, one way that you can get around having mm -hmm. an assistant is if the individual who is the treasurer piece could be appointed as an assistant town clerk. And the town clerk could be appointed as assistant treasurer. That way you have each individual would have the assistant that they need. Okay. <clears throat> just looking for options here, just trying to figure out if there's more work for one side than there is the other. So I think you've answered the question. Thank you. How are the salaries for these positions set. Who does, who's, who sets the the pay? That's set up into the budget. That that's set by finance and town manager when they present the budget to the select board. And the salary itself may be based on information that they get from the VLCTs. Um, survey that they do of um, positions, uh, municipal positions and salaries um, from across the state. Um, 
and, and base the salary on whatever ranges there are for length of service and, and position. Um, because, you know, there are many towns where clerk and treasurer are two separate positions. There are also a number of towns where it is the same individual who holds, who holds both positions. Larry, to, to add more detail to that, Joyce is uh, correct, uh, but to add more detail, uh, when the town manager and uh, finance director do hold meetings with department directors, um, we ask staff or department directors to present their, their proposals for budget for the next fiscal year. We go through it line by line. We discuss these specific points. Um, when it comes specifically to the two offices within the town government, the treasurer's office and the lister's office, um, Cliff and I don't really have any, all, all we do is essentially receive the information from those two offices. So there could be a scenario where someone presents a budget with increased salary amount. Um, we would not be able to say, no, that's not based on this. That's not, you know, it's not based on uh, the state's uh, information that's collected by VOCP, it would be the budget that is set by that elected official. Um, so if someone presents a salary of $150,000, it would be, it would be a problem because town government would not be able to, to say no, it would have to go through the budget process and then essentially be voted on because town government would not be able to make changes to a budget presented by the treasurer clerk's office for the listers office. Wow, really? So, so if in that sort of a situation, if the if the town clerk um, decided to increase the salary to some ridiculous amount, the only recourse would be to have the town budget voted down it on um, on election day. Well, that's usually when you have your budget hearings. You meet with the the. the particular departments and if you feel that there's something too high you work to compromise and come up with a budget that will work within the framework i mean since i've been on board i have never made a request for an increase in my salary the salary has always been increased based on whatever was provided from vlct or the manager's office made the recommendation or the budget committee made the re recommendation I myself have never put in a request for an increase in my salary. Yeah. Um, no, I, I'm, I don't think that this has been a problem in the past. I'm, I'm sure that it hasn't. I'm just, I just did this and, all and, new and information. I can tell you that, and, and I'm just yeah, and interested I, in how it can work. And it just seems that's just, I don't know, for lack of a better word, an interesting situation that, that, the, that the town clerk's office sets their own budget and that. Well, we, pr we give you a pr proposed budget. Okay. I can tell you that in years past, we give a pro we, we provide a budget. And during the process, either we are asked questions of why you need something, what it is. Mm -hmm. And in, in a couple of particular years that I can remember where um, the economic situation was kind of tight. There was requests made across the board for, but you know, all departments to try and keep their budgets down. You know, I I I believe that the budgets themselves, we each department head will submit what they they believe they need for their budget, but you know, the the budget committee, the finance director, the town manager will review those requests, and they may adjust things. And I can tell you that in the past there have been adjustments made without department heads being informed that they were changed. Uh -huh. So it isn't always directed by the department heads. So that's great. The department heads in most cases are employees of the town manager. Has he, so, uh, and it's good to hear that you've worked with them and, and come to an agreed budget, but the possibility is there that the next person elected could come in with a much higher budget that they want. Um, and as you said, it's their job to point out the rules and the laws. They could be very clear with, hey, this is what we want and this is how it's gonna be. I mean, it's the same as we could get somebody in there that doesn't communicate. It's just 
trying to understand what all the pitfalls are for either scenario. I the bottom you. line is the budget is the select board's budget. The select board controls the money. So the select board can say, yes, you want to re request this amount, but you know we're looking at the situation here and we need to keep this under a certain amount. Um, and I, you know, I, I think that usually it, if the request is, is reasonable, people will work with you to negotiate it. Sure. Um, I think you'll find that the select board does set the budget that um, they're the only ones that have the authority to do that and to warn it, to warn the articles, not anybody else. So Pat, you think that if, if the town clerk would have come up with a an absurd budget for whatever reason, we're talking hypothetically here, um, that the select board could look at it during the budget, you know, the time of the year when we're doing the budget and we could say, sure. no, select we're board. not gonna do that. We're gonna, we're, that's not gonna be, we're gonna change that item to a different amount and we're gonna present and that we're gonna approve to send to the voters. Select board controls the budget, not the town clerk, not the listers. Select board controls it until it's warned, and then the voters control it. A point of clarification, I, I, Pat, Pat is, is not inaccurate. He, he is correct in that the select board approves the budget. However, I think the, the question at hand is the independence of the office of the clerk treasurer. And <clears throat> although Pat is correct in that the select board sets the budget, votes to, to agree to present that budget to the town voters, um, the select board and you know, the town manager cannot make changes to the treasurer clerk proposed budget. But so, they have yes, in the past. Well, right, correct. I, I mean, they, they, could, they, could, they could make the request, but I think to the point, Joyce, that you've made is the offices are independent. And tech, you know, could they have, you know, for whatever reason, maybe they did, I wasn't around for those situations, but um, I think the position because it's independent could have held firm and said, no, I'm an elected official. I have my own budget. This is, it is what it is. And even though in the end, the town, you know, it's a town manager's budget until he or she presents it to the select board, at which point it becomes the select board's budget presented to the taxpayers. However, within that budget, the town manager and the select board cannot, I'm going to say legally, make changes to budgets presented by the lister's office and the treasurer. I don't know if there could be, you know, negotiations or discussions or, you know, whatever it was that happened in the past, but if the treasurer clerk held firm and the lister's held firm, that would be what would be included in the budget presented to the taxpayer. I disagree with that. I disagree with that, Phil. It's the, I mean, you can- that, that's, the, that's the purpose of the conversation here is that the, the treasurer clerk is independent. And if there is no independence, um, then the select board would set the budget for the clerk treasurer. The, it's an independent the, office at the moment. The town clerk and the lister's office are independent and so it comes to the financial aspect. It's, I, the, it's the- The duties of the office are independent, but the, the finances are controlled by the select board. Correct. Right. And, and so, in so much as that the select board accepts the budget presented by the town manager, the town manager accepts the budget presented by the treasurer clerk and the listers. I, as a town manager, could not take Joyce's budget and say, I'm slashing your salary, I'm slashing your budget, because I, I would not have that authority. Joyce is an elected official, and I would not have the authority to make changes to her budget. She would have to make her own budget changes. The only thing I can do is accept those, accept the budget and present it. Now there could be there could be some ways to disagree and say, you know, I, I don't agree with this, I don't agree with that, but it's not the town manager's position to change the budget of the listers or the clerk or the or the clerk treasurer. But it is the select board that controls the budget. Oh, sounds sounds like we're, we're not gonna have an agreement here, but here, I just, uh, maybe we're getting too far afield here. And if we are, I apologize for taking up your time, but um, 
is it possible if that were, if, in, if let's say uh, for the moment that Adolfo is right, um, would it be possible to split off the, the, the clerk treasurer's office from the rest of the budget and present it to the voters as a separate budget? I would have to check with, with VLCT. I don't see why that would be different or a problem. Um, I think as a matter of, of convenience and expediency, we've done it where it's all a part of one. But um, you know, I, I'd have to check with, with VLCT on whether that would be possible. I, I could see because of the independence that it could be possible, but I would have to, I would have to speak with VLCT about that. Okay, thanks. So oh, just out of <clears throat> curiosity, where does the budget committee come in on this? Are they reviewing this particular part of the budget or do they have no jurisdiction over this? The budget committee reviews the entire budget, but the challenge I think the nuance that we're we're focusing on is that the argument is being made that the budget is the select board's budget. The argument I'm making is that that is not incorrect. However, there is the specific nuance in that the select board would not be able to make a change to that specific budget. So even if even if the budget committee were reviewing the budget as a whole before it became the select board's budget that was presented to the voters, even if they had questions about uh, the budget presented by the treasurer clerk or the lister's office, it's, it's, it's only a matter of discussion unless the treasurer clerk and the listers chose to engage in that conversation. Uh, if there's no choice to engage, um, to Joyce's point, we haven't really had a problem with her engagement. It's worked out great with the listers that we have now. I haven't had a problem uh, with, with the way things have worked. However, there could be the, you know, with an elected position, there is the issue where there could be no communication as the board, the board pointed out earlier, and someone could present a budget that says, no, this is my budget. I'm done talking. It is what it is. This is it. Uh, it is a very extreme example that I'm using, but it's not out of the realm of reality. It, it can happen. And then the select board, you know, it, it's a part of the budget because it's, as Larry pointed out, and as I pointed out, is that it's all been a part of one until the VLCT or our attorney says, yes, you can split them out into three different votes. Town vote, treasurer, clerk vote, budget, and then the listers budget. Okay, um, so just out of curiosity, Cliff, are you still there? Yep, yeah, yeah, he's there. Could I you am. like weigh in on that little situation given past experiences? Is this something that we should consider or what do you think? Well, I know, you know, and I don't know the, how it, fits in with the statute, but I know up in Williamstown, going back to that nice little um, love nest up there, um, the select board and the clerk had a, had a disagreement about um, how many hours she was being open and what she was getting paid. And the select board says, well, we set the salary. You might set the, the hours, but we set the salary based on how many hours you're open. And so, you know, you're not going to get a free ride. And there was, I don't know, I don't remember what the um, final resolution on that was. But I do know that there was that discussion about who, who really sets that budget. And I, and I think the select board won out on that one. And I can tell you that in a number of small towns, um, town clerks are unable to pay their assistant because the select board will not give them the salary to pay for an assistant, even though by statute they're required to have an assistant. So, you know, the select board controls that budget. 
So he said they require to have an assistant or if they have one, they can choose who it is. By statute, the clerk and the treasurer are required to have an assistant. If you don't appoint an assistant within a certain number of days, then the select board gets to appoint an, an assistant. But the salary for those positions is set by the select board. And I, I know of a number of small towns where they have somebody who is quote unquote appointed as an assistant, but they don't have a salary to pay them. Okay, I think we have beat this one about as much as we can tonight. Um, and since it has to be a discussion that takes place on the floor, uh, we have plenty of time to research some of this stuff uh, and bring it back up again for discussion if we decide we wanna put it out to the voters. So with that, I would like to move on to the other items in the agenda, if we could. Anybody oppose that? Thanks again, Joyce. You're welcome. Thank Thanks, you. Joyce. Thank you, Joyce. Thank you, Joyce. No, I'm fine with that. Thank you, Joyce. Thank you. Next up uh, is grants. We have a CDBG hearing requirement. Thank you to the board again for its previous support of the um, uh, town management's request to apply for CDBG TV grant. Um, we had previously informed the select board that the state was changing requirements and it, and it wasn't because they wanted to, it, it was um, a matter of federal government also making changes and we just needed to catch up on the state level and down on down to the municipal level. So uh, shortly after the last meeting of the select board, additional guidance had been released by the state um, and thanks to Julie for having found that information, uh, the timelines became less severe, more favorable to long-term planning. Uh, the new hearing deadline or the new um, uh, application deadline is September 25th when we initially had believed that the application deadline would be September 10th. Um, that The change in the deadline allows for more time to discuss the issue allowed for more time for Julie and her team to pull together a project. Um, and so it, Julie's on the, the line now, if the board would like to hear from her. Hi, thanks. Thanks Adolfo. Um, yeah, so typically the hearing, uh, the time uh, allowed for hearing notice is 15 days. Uh, this may have actually been changed more than once, but the current guidance says that the notice in the paper of general circulation must be at least two days prior to the date the hearing is held and must be at least five days before the application is submitted to the agency. Um, so that means sort of giving a little leeway in the budget, in the time budget here. Say we submit on the 24th, just in case. Um, that would mean that it could be, the hearing could be uh, no later than the 18th of September. Um, and to allow for some time to uh, continue to prepare the application, we figured it would be nice if it, um, if it were no earlier than the 16th of September, because that gives you uh time to notice either the very end of the week prior which is the 11th or the beginning of that week the 14th assuming that you're noticing in a daily paper like the valley news and not the herald if you're noticing in the herald then i think the last notice date is the 10th but you would have to get it in by the 8th or 9th at that point uh, and when the notice uh, goes in, it has to, you have to be done with your draft application. So, so the window from what we can figure looks something like uh, notice by uh, sometime between the 10th and the 12th 
uh, is is in the paper, and um, that leaves sort of a window of hearing dates, uh, which is sort of mid to late week, the week of um, the sort of Wednesday would be the 16th, Thursday the 17th, Friday the 18th. Does that make sense to folks? <laughs> that, <clears throat> that's presuming a herald notification in next Thursday's edition, correct? That's right. We would have to get the notice in a day or two prior to get it in the herald by the 10th. Right. It gives you a little more leeway because say that say that the hearing's on the 16th, theoretically they could do it the day before as long as you get it uh, in by 10 o'clock. I've actually had recent experience where a daily paper missed the deadline and it, it required me to redo an RFP. So I've learned my lesson and I try to give an extra day just in case, even with the dailies. So I would say, you know, give yourself three days just in case. Are we required or do we have the option of choosing the Herald over uh, the Valley News or the Valley News over the Herald, or do we have to be in both? No, it says uh, it says the pub hearing notice must appear in a newspaper of general circulation in the area. Um, that's all it says. It also has to be um, posted in the municipal website near the municipal office and two other designated public places. Tom, to your specific question, you know, sometimes we we read too much into something, but um, conversations that Julie, Josh, and I have had where we are remaining true to the literal word in that the daily circulation of the Valley News is actually, it's remaining true to what is very specific to the law. So although we would like to help the Herald, I, I think because of how quickly things have been moving, yeah advertising within the Herald, which we can do also, but I think it would hinder us only specifically focus on the Herald because of its limited printing. Right. No, I, I wasn't asking the question, um, kind of on uh, advocating for any one paper or the other. I was asking the question for what works best with the timeline that oh. we want to, um, I certainly wasn't advocating for going with the Herald. I'm advocating for going with whichever is the most convenient with the timeline um, that we are proposing here, if that makes sense. Um, and it sounds like going with the daily is probably more apropos. So Adolfo, how does this work when the when we do our annual appointments and all that? Don't we select in there the the where we'll publish? different things? Uh, I don't believe that the board specifically sets it, it, it. There are requirements for where to post, um, say at town hall, at places where people normally congregate in town. And it does specify that it, the, the item has to be in print, but it, we don't specifically mention as a town that it would be in the local paper at least not that I can recall. Um, it does have to be posted in the local paper, but uh, I'd have to double check. If, I don't think it specifically mentions the Herald because it would be a, the generic process for, for moving forward. Yeah, but we used to, in the, when we agreed to all the, uh, every year we had uh, appointments to committees and different, roles, the dog catcher, all that. Yeah. And in that document, it used to say where our, our official newspaper notice sites, that type of thing. Because we were not very happy with the Herald at one point, and we looked at changing the name of the newspaper we would use for posting. That's the only reason I'm thinking of that. Um, I just don't want to see you get caught on publishing it somewhere and everybody comes back and says, wait a minute, you've identified this would be your location. Yeah, I could, I could, I can research that topic um, to see specifically where we, where we mentioned postings and, and I think that if, 
if the board took action today to set a hearing date, we can meet the deadline for both the Herald and the Valley News. Um, so, but I could still specifically look for that uh, that point in our record. So what action do you need us to take on this? Well, at this point, um, the board had previously been open to scheduling a hearing and today was one of the initial dates to, to meet to set the hearing. Uh, so we would, what we would like to do is to ask the board to set a date to hold a hearing um, within the time frame that Julie had mentioned. And once that hearing date is set, I and Julie and Josh can work on the details such as where to post, local circulation to post to circulation and continue with the application process. Any other comments or questions on this? If not, anybody have a motion? Julie, can you repeat the, the date, the time window that would work for the dates of the actual hearing? Yeah, the sweet spot, um, the sweet spot is sort of the 16th or the 17th. Um, because either one of those would give you more than five days before the submission is due and um, more than uh, two to three days uh, uh, for notice to be in a paper, okay. which, whichever paper you choose. And and to, to our selfish interest would, would give us more time to prepare the application. And presumably this hearing will be held via Zoom or maybe via uh, RACDC's portal, mm -hmm. is that correct? Okay. Right, we would have to publish um, a location being a URL, I think, although people can submit comments in writing and we would also have to figure out, usually people can come to the town office to look at the draft application and so we would have to make um, special accommodation, you know, to email it to people to be able to meet them somewhere to show it to them or whatever, which we would work out um, some way to do that. Um, with that in mind, then I would like to move that we set the hearing date for um, via whatever URL portal it winds up being for Thursday uh, evening. Uh, September 17th and notice it as such um, in both the Herald and Valley News. Second that. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Can I ask Julie a question? Hang Maybe. on a second, please. Opposed? Mr. Payne, motion carries. Go ahead, Pat. Um, Select board members don't have to be there, right? We don't need a quorum. Am I correct about that? Well, I believe a quorum is I believe a quorum is needed of the select board uh, because it's 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 the the board that's authorizing the the grant process. So, um, just to I think amplify a little uh, what Adolfo was saying, I think that the for the hearing. I'm not sure that it's necessary, but usually what happens is there is a meeting scheduled directly after it to allow to authorize the vote. Now that may have, I think you voted last time to do something to move ahead with the application, but there's kind of a specific resolution that the grant requires. And usually that happens right after the hearing enabling the town to move forward or you know to uh, actually apply for the grant so we'd want to have that vote the same night and that's the one i think that adolfo's referring to you need a vote of the select board on the same evening as the hearing it doesn't have to be it just typically is a time saver if you can adjourn one and and do the other i don't know, trini you may know better than i do how this works but that everyone I've been to, that's how it's worked mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for convenience. To Julie's point, that that's been the the general practice for when the select board, at least through my tenure, 
when the select board has had to hold a hearing and then make a decision. The hearings are typically commenced at 5.30, the day of select board meetings. And then immediately following the hearing, the select board has its meeting. And then if a decision is to be made, makes it at that, at that meeting. Well, once we know the date, we can decide yeah. if we can, how all that's going to work. Okay. The next grant we have is the Janet Foundation Arts and Cultures Committee. Yeah, and I'm actually going to, uh, I've looked further into that grant after just learning about it through an article in the Free Press last week. And uh, upon further explanation, uh, exploration. I don't think uh, that particular grant meets the, uh, that we meet the criteria for that particular grant for the purpose for which we were going to apply. So I would say um, would, would pull that one from uh, your consideration tonight. That was quick. Yeah. Uh, Lamson Howell Foundation. Uh, Lamson Howell Foundation, as, as I believe all of you know, is a Randolph-based foundation. Uh, the Arts and Culture Committee would like to um, apply to the Lamson Howell Foundation for some grant support uh, towards matching the Byrne Foundation grant we've gotten for the proposed Village Mural Project. And uh, simply I'm asking on behalf of the Arts and Culture Committee this evening to um, uh, have the select board's permission to go ahead and pursue a potential grant from Lamson Howell for that purpose. What's the proposed budget you're looking for there? Well, the, the grant that we uh, got from the Byrne Foundation is a $6,000 challenge grant that we need to match with um, uh, local fundraising from a variety of sources. And the total budget for the initial mural project is estimated at $12,000. So we're okay. looking at uh, raising and, and my thinking uh, based on past experience of working with Lamson Howell when I was at um, Chandler is um, to, to ask Lamson Howell for uh, half of the remaining money we need to raise, which would be a $3,000 grant and then see what we then see what we got. Then we'll look for funding from just GoFundMe or something like that? Yeah, or, or um, well, to give you an example, uh, two members of the Arts and Culture Committee, uh, Vincent Freeman and Andy Mueller, are putting together a benefit concert uh, that's going to be live streamed from um, Huggable, Huggable Mug uh, later this month, and they're using that as a fundraiser um, for this mural project. Uh, Talking with Cliff and Joyce and Adolfo, uh, what we've determined to do with any community-based fundraising is we're going to set up a dedicated fund in the general fund that will be earmarked for, um, for this mural project and for ongoing projects related to it. And uh, people can make contributions directly to the town of Randolph uh, earmarked specifically for that fund. So that's what we're going to do for individual fundraising. Uh, it's very similar to what we've done just in recent days working with Adolfo um, for the installation of the sculpture at Rosalind uh, Burgess's gardens up on Elm Street. Okay. Does that, just curious, does that give everybody that? Does that give everybody the opportunity to use that as a uh, tax deductible donation? Uh, Cliff and Adolfo might be better. I don't think Cliff is here anymore. Is he? um, I can speak to that, Tom. Uh, we yeah. have previously made inquiries with our attorney specifically about donations directly to the town. Um, although the town is not a, a 501c3 and we do not issue donation receipts, um, donations made directly to the town uh, are eligible for um, tax, tax purposes, correct, uh, yeah. Just checking, just wanna make sure that we're- Yeah, yeah. Get going in the right direction so nobody comes back and says, oh, you know, I donated, but I didn't get my tax deduction. Right, right. We, I did look into setting up a GoFundMe type fundraiser for, um, 
both for Roz's park project and for this mural. And it just, it proved to be um, a really daunting process because yep. um, we don't want to expose the town's general fund banking account to possible hacking through GoFundMe. So it just, yeah. um, it was too much of a hassle. So under Adolfo's direction, I, we just decided to go with this route of having people write checks directly to the town with the memo line saying it's earmarked for a specific fund. Okay. Um, yeah. Just uh, don't want, been down this path as you well know. Oh long yeah. Haul, long yeah. haul get to, to where it's a, tax deductible contribution, so. Absolutely. Wouldn't even bring it up if I hadn't gone through it myself. <laughs> <laughs> Jenny, yeah. I'll move that the select board approve the Arts and Culture Committee applying for a grant to the Lampson Howell Foundation. I'll second that. All those in favor? Aye. Okay. Aye. Opposed? Abstained? Motion carries. Trans Municipal Highway Stormwater Mitigation. This is a, a grant that's uh, made available through VTrans yearly. Uh, I would like to ask the select board to authorize the town to apply for these funds um, as we have projects that are um, that could benefit from funds through this grant. Um, some of the projects that are funded are stormwater mitigation uh, engineering. Um, what we would seek to have is funding for um, bank stabilization, um, and some of our roads are in need of some some uh, embankment stabilization. Would this fund some of the uh, items that Two Rivers brought before us? It, it can. Um, that I think type the of challenge project. is that even the the stormwater projects that have been brought to us by. Um, Two rivers over the years, some of them we have addressed uh, through other grants. For example, one of our existing grant and aid projects that we are, uh, or grant and aid grant programs that, we, uh, that we've been take, making use of. But this specifically, um, we have two roads that are in major need of repairs. One is North Randolph Road and, and one that will soon become more uh, in peril is the low stock farm road. Um, the rivers there are meandering and they're, they're doing what nature does and they're causing issues where, where our roads are located. So the, the um, North Randolph Road one should become a priority because half the road is missing right now. Yep. Uh, and there's some concern about getting fire trucks up through there. So uh, understanding that A&R is going to make us jump through these extra hoops before we can do any work there. I think that's one that we ought to be putting as our first priority. Yep, I agree. Are you anticipating these will happen before winter? Uh, well, unfortunately, the, the project on North Randolph Road, we've been notified that we would not receive any permits to do any work until only until we had an engineering study performed. Um, so the first step would be to perform the engineering study, and that would take that would take time. Um, I don't, I don't. If it was an emergency, I think A and R would be less restrictive. But um, and we are bordering on that point at the where the road is now. Um, but I don't think they would give mm -hmm. us a pass until we had the engineering study. Terry, one of the items they want the engineer to look okay. at is closing the road. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, we were specifically right. told that one of the one of the uh, one of the options that needed to be in the engineer study is abandoning North Randolph Road, at least a large section of it because the river there is going to keep making its inroads and potentially keep um, eating into the embankment. So that needs to be one of the options according to ANR. Um, that road um, eroded many times over the years. Yeah. It has, and it's been 
but it's still a little, you know, I'm still a viable link from North Randolph to Randolph Center. I'm not totally sure that abandoning that stretch of road is a good idea, but I can think of other pieces I'd love to abandon. <laughs> <laughs> you may not be able to argue with Mother Nature, Perry. Um, yeah, I've poured into a lot of different projects, and I can tell you right now, there's there are solutions. It's just a matter of who who squeaks the le the, the most. Yeah, yeah. Sheet piling works magic on those. That's right. <laughs> there's solutions here. This, you know, uh, I'm not quite sure that we get to a you know that we go down the road of abandoning a stretch of road that I think is a viable link to the community. Oh that yeah. A lot of in my opinion, okay, that's a traffic study and a lot of other things that go with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So do we want to authorize the application for this grant? Yeah, I'll make a motion to authorize the application. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstained? Motion carries. Any old business? No. Hearing none. Any other business? None. Manager's report? Uh, just a few items. Uh, uh, I'll be brief. Um, one of them is that the uh, Sunrise Rotary Club uh, commenced its work on Harmony Park. Uh, they have started digging in, and some of the instruments will be brought soon. But uh, earlier this week, we did have members of the Rotary out there uh, performing work on their time, and um, it's just interesting to see how the community has really ra rallied around the project, and a lot of people are expressing interest in seeing it done, uh, so I wanted to share that with the board. Um, uh, RACDC uh, applied for a grant. Um, they, Julie had partnered with Josh, and they worked together on on an application, uh, and I, I believe it was uh, Northern Borders grant, um, and they received $450,000 to go toward the infrastructure at Salisbury Square. So that will be a huge uh, jolt to the project, and uh, Julie was very excited about that. Uh, we are very excited about that. So it was a, a decent amount of money that was received for, for that project. Uh, and the third is uh, about uh, two years ago, the state had approached the town to potentially install EV chargers at town hall or somewhere in, on town property. Uh, there was a match uh, and then the cost of the electricity had to fall onto the town for a number of reasons. Uh, you know, we did not go through with the process um, uh, more specifically because the chargers themselves were not the class three, it was a class one and those would require eight hours of charging time for a full full charge to vehicle. So there were some restrictions there. Uh, Josh received notice that the state has changed its process and they are now fully funding EV charging units being installed with no local match. Um, just as part of the process, we presented different options that the board had previously discussed, including here at Town Hall, up by the interchange, and then also uh, next to the Trillium building in the municipal lot. Uh, I believe the state liked several of the options, but chose the location next to the Trillium building, which is on private property. So now the town, I believe, will receive class up to class three chargers at no cost on private property. So the town will benefit from having them. Uh, but will not have to have any any match or any kind of financial liability involved in, in the process. So um, I believe that is still in the works, but at some point in the near future, the, the town will have class three EV chargers on private property and they will be available to everyone. Adolfo, I, I think the level one charger is the fastest charger. Is it level one? Okay. Sorry, I had those mixed up, but... Uh, but yes, it would be. There are no restrictions on the chargers, um, so they the the fastest charger is is available for for installation. So, thank you, Larry. How many how many chargers in the proposal? I believe it will be one. It's a dual charge, so it would be one unit with two plugs. And the reason why the the, the reason why we presented the options 
to the state that we had initially presented to the select board uh, are because they require, each one of these units require uh, three phase power. And so that's why we, we represented the same options to the state. That's great. I'm going to buy myself a big electric truck. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's all I have for a manager's report. I'm going to buy a wrecker, Perry, so I can come pull you to your location. That, that's what I thought. <laughs> <laughs> An electric wrecker? Yeah, I'm going to get the electric wrecker. I didn't say it was going to be electric, Tom. <laughs> yeah. And I, I have the horsepower. <laughs> We run short five miles away from the job. Trini can come pull me the rest of the way. There you go. Great generator. <laughs> Trini, Trini, would you entertain a question on their other business? Sure. Larry, I know I've been interested in meeting in person again. And I just wondered what other people thought about that. In person. Meeting in person. Oh. Meeting in person, sure. I'm good with that. I I would be okay with it, considering that I've been with one in-person meeting with you since I was elected, and the week after that, uh, we went to Zoom. So it'd be nice to see you all again. Do we get to pick uh, our own? The, the only issue, uh, Adolfo, is... Um, until town hall fully reopens, what are um, any concerns you might have about public access to a meeting when we're all meeting in person, given the lack of um, computer uh, microphones and cameras at town hall? Uh, well, if the meeting is to be held in person, I would have to re recheck the, the meeting requirements uh, or the guidance. The last time I checked, it was for a... Um, one of our committee meetings. And if a meeting is to be held indoors, there is a, there is a cap to the number of people that could be indoors. Um, I'd have to check what the cap is. I believe there are also face covering, mandatory face covering requirements. Uh, so social distancing has to be also a part of, of an indoor meeting. Um, the challenge, I, I don't think we will we will come across this challenge, but Let's say everybody wants to get out of their house because they're bored and we have a 10 person maximum Well, that 10 person maximum is 50% uh, is met by the board and by me attending the meeting. So, and we cannot, we cannot close the meeting to anyone who wants to attend. So we would have to cancel the meeting if we have more people attend than is allowed. If I, if I may uh, add something, uh, this, Rotary Sunrise Club has gone to what's called a hybrid meeting. We meet in person and we also have Zoom capability. And it, uh, it worked out pretty well when we met last. You may wanna look at the hybrid solution. I can uh, give you some information on that, Adolfo. I appreciate that, Tony, thank you. Um, I, I know that if we were to go through that model, we would have to invest in video infrastructure. We don't have cameras, but we are in the process of purchasing cameras. Um, you know, there, there are little things that we would have to see if it could work. And I think we can make it work. It's just a matter of sharing that information with the board ahead of time. Yeah. Yeah. What Sunny's describing is oh, the planning commission. I had in mind. Well, the planning commission has been meeting outdoors at Grant Camp and at the rec center. So, you know, I can rent you a big tent. <laughs> The simple the, solution uh, is just planning. get rid of all the, the PCs planning. and get Max uh, at Town Hall and they have built-in cameras and my <laughs> so. Planning Commission had a meeting uh, outside at the uh, Recreation Center in, in the pavilion and uh, that worked out pretty well. Perry, you were at that meeting, so. Yeah, it, yeah. it was not a problem. And, you know, it's getting a little cooler, so if you're going to do gonna this, say, yeah. you better get it under your belt in the next couple of weeks. It's going to get a little chilly come November. So. Yeah, well. Yeah, I got but, for the, but for the hybrid meeting, uh, what we did, uh, we, we bought this one microphone that sits in the middle of the room, and it's, it's an amazing microphone. It captures the voices of everyone around the room loud and clear, even though they're masked. And uh, we have a large TV screen, 
uh, where people on uh, coming in on Zoom are shown on the TV screen. So they can see, the people on Zoom can see everybody in the room and everybody in the room can see everybody that's on Zoom. So it, it works both ways. And of course, all your Zoom meetings are recorded. So uh, you could use the recording of the Zoom meeting uh, for your, you know, whatever Shannon does, uh, use that. It, I think it'll work. And we'd still have Orca on hand too, so. Correct. Yeah. I can I can work out uh, the specific details. Um, you know, I, I will revisit the guidance issued by VLCT and the state. It is possible, um, you know, and I, I will see when, I know Cliff and I discussed ordering cameras. I can see when they, they arrive. Um, if they don't arrive in time, I'm pretty sure, you know, staff would be willing to, if they're willing to share a, one of their personal cameras, or I could bring in a one of my lap or a laptop that has a, a camera built into it and, and use that. So, yeah, um, might be a little dicey work. to get it done for next week, but. Uh, yeah, but I could I could I could certainly look into it for next week. I think worst case scenario for the hearing would be probably the the soonest that um, the seventeenth. Yeah. Yeah, the seventeenth. Yeah. yeah. Well, appreciate the suggestion, Larry. It would be nice to yeah actually see all of you again. It's been a and I know Larry misses. He's missing all of us. I can see yeah. it. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, he's out there in you know Colorado and yeah. Uh, Okay. <laughs> All right. Any other topics? Manager's report. You got it. Yeah, that was that was it for the manager's report. Yeah. Okay. Well, next we have executive session. All right. I'll make a motion. We go into executive session. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstained? Motion carries. So I will share with the board that um, I, I will log off. Um, Tom, Tom is currently set as a co-host. So uh, unless there are other internet issues, if Tom would, will, will remain on the meeting and can uh, limit anyone from entering. There is a waiting room set so no one should just be able to enter the executive session. Uh, if, I, if I may ask the board, uh, if there are any actions taken after the meeting, if someone could please take note of that. And then also just the times of when the board exited executive session and then um, concluded the meeting, that would be helpful when I pull the meeting, the meeting minutes together. Just a question about the item on the agenda that says post executive session decision. At that point, we're back in public um deliberations again is that correct that is correct yes um uh, after voting to exit executive session that's when post decision is to happen if okay. if there is a decision to be made right and, and and at that point anybody that's in the waiting room would then be re i would readmit correct that is correct yeah okay thank you um may i may i jump in here this is dave yeah Go ahead, Dave. Um, I'm just wondering if this waiting room feature is the way for me to tune back in for the post-executive session decision and how that works. So I could share an answer uh, if everyone's okay with. Uh, so the answer would be, Dave, at this point, uh, what I would do is, um, you know, I would essentially be kicking everybody out who is not a member of the select board and not going into executive session. Um, sure. And then the option would be is anyone who logs back in is automatically put into the waiting room and they sit in the waiting room until the host admits them into the meeting. So if you were to be removed from the meeting and then you immediately called back in, you would just remain in the waiting room until the host allowed you back into the meeting. I see. Okay. All right. And and uh, just to be clear, uh, Adolfo, I, I am now taking over as host. Um, the waiting room pops up as 
as something on my screen so that I know to admit Dave or whoever else may be trying to get back in. Is that correct? Uh, yes, if you were to click the participants tab at the bottom of your screen. Right. And then on your right hand side, you see if you see a current list that says participants, if there's someone in the waiting room at the very top, it'll say waiting room and then give okay. the name of the person of the Excellent. waiting room. Excellent, yeah. okay. I just wanted to be sure of that so that uh, uh, if indeed we do have a post uh, session decision, uh, I, I just wanted to be sure I knew how to let anyone, Dave or anyone else back in. So good, we're good. Yeah, in case this system has a caller ID feature, uh, my phone number will show up as my wife's name rather than my own. Okay. Right now you're showing up as you, Dave, so. Um, yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. So I will sign off and sign back in. Perfect. Bada bing, just like that. Bingo. And I will, okay. um, thank you, Dave. And I will, just to let the board know, um, I will now sign off or remove Orca Media, and then I will log off as well. Okay. Very good.